It certainly is a pleasure to uh, be here with this uh, group, uh, some old friends, and uh, I'm sure a number of people who have a lot of questions about uh, this uh, disease. Peritoneal mesothelioma has its differences from other malignancies, but it's, it's very much the same in terms of outcome. If we can recognize this disease early and apply the definitive treatments uh, that have been uh, referred to uh, by previous speakers, the outcome is extremely good. Perhaps 75% of people alive and well and disease-free uh, at, at uh, five years. Now, that's, it's, it's an incredible contrast to the thoracic mesothelioma uh, situation. And actually, I, I think Marf deserves uh, some credit, and now IMIG, also uh, uh, the International Mesothelioma Foundation, is beginning to recognize that this rare disease, a variant of a more common disease, is where we've seen a lot of progress. It's a problem, though. I mean, all three of our speakers here were from the, uh, were from the East Coast. And what do you do if you've got peritoneal mesothelioma in the Midwest or on the West Coast? I mean, there's, no, there's really no treatment center for uh, the management of this disease outside of the uh, mid-Atlantic here. And it's very unfortunate, and we do have a lot of people who come from a great distance, and it's, it's very difficult for them and for their families. Uh, and, and we should have a better geographic distribution of the treatment centers uh, throughout uh, the United States. Now, that's only part of the problem. The other problem is most of the patients, and I'm not sure how many mesothelioma diagnoses there are each year, but only a fraction, only a fraction are treated with this multimodality approach that uh, you've heard about here today. Most of the patients are treated with systemic chemotherapy for a while. They respond or they don't respond. Uh, sometimes uh, the referral does make it to a center of excellence where people are experienced uh, in the management of this disease. But unfortunately, a majority of patients in the United States with peritoneal mesothelioma only get to a referral center, a place that's maybe managed 100 of these uh, diseases in the past and has a team approach, a multidisciplinary approach that combines the best of surgery with the best of regional chemotherapy. So uh, from my perspective, uh, this is a disease where the, the cup is really half empty. So many more things could be done to improve the management of this rare disorder. Uh, you know, they call it uh, the National Association of, rare, of Orphan Diseases. And, and because the people with these rare diseases are usually treated like orphans, like, uh, you know, they really, like nobody really cares. Um, I don't know why, since there's been, and, and you know, finally, uh, there's going to be a JCO, a Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, manuscript, uh, a combined effort from uh, five or six uh, different, from six different institutions where we've pooled our data and now in one of these uh, retrospective analyses, we're going to be able to show, okay, in 400 patients, when we treated them with this uniform treatment strategy of surgery combined with this hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, we're looking at better than 50% survival at five years. Um, Okay, so we accumulated uh, 400 patients at uh, six different institutions over uh, 
10 years, we should have accumulated many thousands of data points on patients with peritoneal mesothelioma, and we'd be all that much smarter about, uh, about what we're doing. Now, you're going to say, oh, well, you should be organizing uh, this uh, attack on this rare disease where there is now a very well-established treatment strategy. And I'll tell you, the American College of Surgeons is not going to do it, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology is not going to do it, and I think that it's this, it's pressure from this type of group that's going to make a difference. It's going to have to come from patients and say, listen, you really need a treatment center on the West Coast, and you need a treatment center in the Midwest for uh, excellence in treatment, for management of data, for a centralized uh, molecular biological research approach uh, to, uh, to uh, this disease. So maybe I'm just getting too old, but uh, you know, I think we can do a lot better, and I'm, I'm, as I'm asking the uh, people here and the organizers of MARF to, uh, to, th to think about uh, trying to uh, make this uh, a more patient-friendly disease, because I, because I can tell you it's extremely hard on patients uh, from all over the country to come here and, uh, and to be treated, and my hospital doesn't really have uh, the uh, uh, wherewithal, you know, to put the patients and their families up, and, you know, it'd be nice if, uh, if we had a Ronald McDonald house and all that sort of thing, but we don't, and so they have to stay in a hotel, and, and uh, it's, not, it's not perfect. It really is far from perfect. Now, the question and answer part of this is definitely the most important, and uh, with my few uh, preliminary remarks, we're already over time. So I'm going to show about two slides, and then I'm going to uh, stop. The uh, next slide, please. I think I have it up here. Now, just look at this. And look at the last column there, the, uh, the median survival. Ten months, 15 months, nine months. This is old data, of course, coming back out of the 1980s. This is before we used both surgery and this hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy to uh, treat the disease. And then look what started happening. Uh, and just, just look down the, the, uh, the list of uh, reports, uh, the year in which they were, uh, uh, studies were reported. This actually is one, this is, uh, one of Rich Alexander's uh, reports early on. And, uh, you know, we, we finally jumped out of the two-year median survival above, and, and uh, we're, we're down to five-year median survival. Now, there are no randomized controlled studies, and there never will be. And if the medical oncologists keep asking for evidence-based medicine, they're not going to get it. But the standard of care for this disease is surgery performed by an experienced and knowledgeable oncologist, surgical oncologist, and then the hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Now, not all patients can be treated because some come to us very late, unfortunately. And the later they come, this disease builds up in its aggressiveness over time. If there's a delay in referral and in definitive treatment, things don't turn out so well. Okay, my last slide. This is how patients have done at the hospital center. Uh, this is uh, 100 uh, patients. Um, and you know what? About half the patients are doing well. Now, let me just tell you one little vignette before I stop. There's one group of patients where the referral comes early while the disease is still in its uh, infancy, in its young women. And usually because of an ovarian mass uh, or uh, problems with menstruation, they go to their gynecologist 
and they have a diagnosis made early in the course of the disease, before all the ascites builds up and there's an omental cake and that sort of thing, those patients do incredibly well, and the survival on those group of patients is way up here in the 80% range. So I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. Number one, this disease needs to be diagnosed early, if possible, and referred for definitive treatment. We have a definitive treatment for the disease. Uh, it may w maybe will improve, and, and all the centers here have clinical trials going on in order to try and make some improvements. Number one. Number two, it needs to be available. Uh, in, in a more uh, regionally distributed manner uh, throughout the United States. And exactly how to go about that, I'm not quite sure. It's a political issue. Uh, it's a medical economics issue. But I think that MARF can be of help to us in, uh, in this regard. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. I really look forward to the good questions.